Welcome back to our forum for the second morning session, which is as exciting as the first one. The session is on rapid uh, fire therapies for end stage congenital heart disease, evidence versus aspiration. Briefly, to introduce our two chairs Joyce Wall, that you met yesterday, who is a professor of clinical medicine and the associate medical director of MFT. <laughs> University and a two de force. Joyce, wonderful to be with us. Thank you, Michael. And Fernando Riesco, who is a very important consultant colleague based at Harfield, who is um, uh, the ACHD lead on uh, end stage congenital heart disease, heart failure, transplantation, and mechanical support. Harfield is very important to us. Fernando was striking from the very beginning in that he knew what he wanted to do. He did a year's fellowship with us on ACHD, so he has very good understanding of it, moving to transplantation. So off to you, Joyce and uh, Fernando. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Mike. Hi, hi, everybody. Um, I would just like to thank um, Prof. Gatsoulis and, and everybody on the organization for the opportunity, uh, Michael, chair colleague, uh, Professor Wald. Um, um, we're going to have a busy session uh, with a few speakers talking about very many interesting things. And I would like to introduce the first speaker, Professor Eric Rosendahl, who is a consultant pediatric and adult congenital cardiologist at Guys and St. Thomas um, NHS Foundation Trust. He's been working there since 1996. He is the clinical lead for the congenital catheterization laboratory and the congenital electrophysiology service. Very uh, regular lecturer in international and national conference about the topic and uh, has written many uh, publications about the matters uh, with respect to um, electrophysiology and interventional aspects of congenital heart disease. And it's a pleasure to introduce him. I'm really looking forward to hearing from his presentation about the catheter closure of the sinus venosus ASD. Uh, Professor Rosendahl. Good morning. Uh, well, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and I'm very happy to start the session on evidence versus aspiration. And I hope to show that catheter closure of sinus venosus ASD now has evidence behind it. So the initial evidence appeared in 2014, the very first publication in a 35-year-old woman with sinus venosus defect. She had a six centimeter covered stent placed in her SVC, dilated to 22 millimeters in the right atrium, and this cured the defect. And frankly, I couldn't understand it. But then a few months later, a 60-year-old man came to see me he came for a second opinion because he did not want surgery. I explained surgery was the traditional approach. The complication rate was low. But as I'd seen a case report, just maybe a model of his heart might help us do something. And just to refresh you on the sinus venosus defect, here you see the superior vena cava overriding the right atrium and the left atrium so that it has input into both chambers. But more importantly, the right upper and middle pulmonary veins also override the right atrium and left atrium at the point where the SVC overrides the right atrium and left atrium. And this is where the technique of catheter closure comes into existence. We printed some models. This is a model. There's a stent implanted in the SVC. You can't quite see it and a sheath placed in the right upper pulmonary vein into the left atrium, clearly seen here in the back of the right upper pulmonary vein and the back of the left atrium. When you cut into the SVC, you can see the sheath running behind the defect between the SVC and the pulmonary vein, and you can see that if the stent was covered, this would separate the two circulations. We did more bench testing. We implanted a stent and put a balloon in the model, then took a CT scan of it. And you can see in different projections the appearance. And so from behind, you can see a clear path and clear space for the pulmonary vein into the left atrium and an oblique view. And in an anterior view, and this is 
the confusing view we see both on MRIs and at catheter where the pulmonary vein is hidden behind the SVC. The other important feature was that by putting a balloon here, not only did we demonstrate space, but it gave a clue to a way of protecting the vein if there was a possibility that there was not enough space. And just to go through for those who like diagrams, the pulmonary veins enter at the level of the defect about the SVC RA junction, and the covered stent allows the pulmonary veins to be diverted into the left atrium, uh, whereas the SVC flow goes through the covered stent into the right atrium. In this uh, feature uh, variant of sinus phenosis defect, the pulmonary veins arise very high in the SVC and very anteriorly, and a stent here would block off the vein. So this is not suitable. And it is important to distinguish between this type of defect that is not suitable and this type of defect that is suitable. Having had this concept, we didn't do any animal testing, but we did a lot of bench testing, spoke to colleagues, clinical governance, new procedure committee. We went to the MHRA, permission to use a non-CE marked stent. The company Numed manufactured a Tenzig covered stent. And after informed consent, two years later, we undertook the first procedure. It was an arduous process, but I think rewarding. Here you see a pulmonary vein injection with dye going exclusively into the right atrium, while the balloon in the SVC blocks the defect, but does not block the pulmonary vein. The echocardiogram shows the left to right shunt at sinus phenosis defect level. You can hardly see the pulmonary veins because of the amount of flow. But when you blow up a balloon in the SVC, now you see the pulmonary veins draining into the left atrium. And when you look at the angiogram, and just stop that one, you can now see the pulmonary vein draining beautifully into the left atrium and the stent separating the circulations. You'll notice that the pulmonary vein catheter is placed through a catheter up the aorta into the left ventricle, across into the left atrium, across the defect into the pulmonary vein. A long guide wire from the femoral vein up to the jugular vein and a sheath through which the stent is passed. By patient eight, we hit a problem. We implanted a stent and you see that a few seconds later, the stent starts to move. Fortunately, we still have the guide wire the stent is replaced up into the SVC and then anchored with a new stent pass from the jugular access. This anchors the stent and allows flaring of the bottom end of the stent. We then discovered that six centimeter stents were probably too short for all patients. This is an eight centimeter stent and you can see that as the stent is inflated sequentially, it now shortens down to about five and a half centimeters. I think if we'd started with a six centimeter stent here, we would have ended up with a four centimeter stent, even shorter, which may well have embolized. And this is the angiogram after implanting that stent. You see the pulmonary vein flow going beautifully into the left atrium, nothing coming into the right atrium. This is the first patient we did without a model, a beautiful CT scan showing the SVC overriding the right atrium and the left atrium, and the pulmonary vein coming in at the back also overriding the two chambers. This was a professional diver with a decompression illness. And after placing the stent, the right upper pulmonary vein drains beautifully into the left atrium. You'll also note that the pulmonary angiogram is performed through a catheter passed over a transeptal sheath, rather than the long way round the aorta. And because there was a defect in the foramen ovale as well, we balloon occluded that, we put in an occlutech device. During follow-up, this is a CT scan showing all the pulmonary veins draining beautifully to the left atrium, past the stent, around the stent, and also the occluder in the secundum uh, septum. A negative bubble echoed four months and she was clear to return to diving. In this patient, confirmed that the six centimeter stent was not suitable for most patients. Here you see the stent edge is just at the bottom end of the defect, but does not quite approach the secundum septum. Although the pulmonary vein flow is clearly diverted into the left atrium, there is a leak at this level. This little leak is from the transeptal puncture used to monitor 
pulmonary vein pressure and flow. You can also see on this 3D uh, echo reconstruction, this defect at this level. The options were to put an extra stent in or an ASD device. In the end, we reduced this shunt enormously and elected not to do anything, although perhaps next time we would not do that. In patient number 20, we put in a seven centimeter stent. You can see there's a small leak. The stent is further inflated, inflated further. There's still a residual leak and it is further dilated to abolish the leak. There is, however, only a very short segment anchoring it in the SVC. We debated about whether to put an anchor stent and decided not to. Three hours later, the patient had a few ectopic beats and the stent was in the right ventricular outflow tract. Our surgeons were able to pop it back through the tricuspid valve into the right atrium and remove it uneventfully and repair the defect. I think if we'd used a longer stent or an anchoring stent, we would not have this problem. In patient 25, we recognized the problem with overdilation of the test balloon. Here you see a test balloon in the defect, blown up in the SVC, completely occludes the pulmonary vein, which is outlined beautifully, but there's no flow into the left atrium. Clearly a stent of this dimension would block the pulmonary vein and not do what we intended to do. By using a smaller non-compliant balloon, we were able to get flow into the left atrium. And here again in the lateral view, upper pulmonary vein into left atrium. Perhaps more clearly shown on the TOE, here you see the balloon bulging into the pulmonary veins, the right upper pulmonary vein virtually occluded, the right middle pulmonary vein has got very low flow. Using a non-compliant balloon, we've got good flow down the middle vein, although still some restriction on the right upper pulmonary vein. So in this patient, when implanting the stent through the transeptal axis, we, we placed a balloon to hold the pulmonary vein orifice open and allow the stent to mold around the pulmonary vein orifice. This resulted in beautiful flow from the right upper pulmonary vein into the left atrium here in anterior and in your lateral views. So between March 2016 and January 21, we implanted 29 stents in patients 18 to 65 years of age. Five stents moved towards the right atrium, were repositioned and anchored with a second stent quite uneventfully. The one stent I showed you embolized which if we'd anchored, I believe would not have done. There was one tamponade which required surgical drainage, we could not find a source of bleeding for that. There was one significant residual leak I showed you at the bottom end of the stent, but a significant improvement in right ventricular volumes. There's been no sinus, no disease, and no SVC or pulmonary vein stenosis. We reviewed 48 patients as this program started out. 29 were accepted for percutaneous treatment. Two would have had treatment, but for COVID and are still awaiting. Surgical closure in 17 patients. Four were due to patient physician preference at the start of our experience. Four required concomitant coronary or valve procedures. And in nine, the patient was unsuitable for veins that were in a position that would be occluded by the stent. When we looked at the MRI at a year, we found a significant fall in right ventricular and diastolic volumes to normal in the majority. The one patient with a residual shunt had a reduction, but still had a significant shunt. But all the other patients, the shunt was less than 1.2 to 1. We've moved to virtual models rather than creating uh, 3D printed models. This is from Fu. He has created the model of the defect and then virtually implanted a stent. You can see the pathway from the right upper pulmonary vein to the left atrium with a lovely uh, space for the vein to drain unobstructedly. Uh, more advanced than that, which we have not used uh, in Milan, with the 3D uh, virtual model. Again, they use it to do the measurements and then using the virtual reality have been able to implant a stent virtually to practice the procedure. 
So what have we learned? We've learned that transeptal monitoring has replaced the cumbersome arterial route. It is faster. It allows simultaneous pulmonary vein and left atrial pressure measurement. So we know we're not causing obstruction. And together with TOE, this reduces angiography. We're able to place a balloon into the pulmonary vein for protection in those veins where it looks as though they might be partially obstructed by the stent. And that has been very successful. Non-compliant balloons avoid bulging into the pulmonary vein and raise the often false concern of occluding the vein. The anchor stent in the SVC traps a mobile stent where there's inadequate acquisition length. Using an uncovered stent will also main pa maintain patency of a high, tiny accessory right up a pulmonary vein that is neither surgically nor catheter divertible. But we've discovered that the longer stent, seven, and oftentimes the eight centimeter stent gives better apposition length in the SVC, allows flaring without too much shortening or displacement. What is the world experience and can we call this evidence? We've implanted 29 stents. We've helped the team in Dublin implant two. The next bigger series is in Chennai with 23 stents. They've used a variety of stents, different types, and they've had three that embolized. Uh, the group in Iraq implanted four stents, actually back in 2013. Uh, in two, they required an atrial septal defect device at the lower end of the defect. In Rio and Doha, each of them implanted two stents. And there are at least eight reports, single reports of cases, all with different strategies. So in conclusion, interventional closure of sinus venosus ASD and partial pulmonary anomalous venous drainage is possible in about three quarters of adult patients. Low incidence of leaks, no sinus, no disease, and so far no, no SVC or pulmonary vein stenosis. It avoids the morbidity of stenotomy and cardiopulmonary bypass, and is particularly useful in the elder patient and those with morbidity for whom bypass would be contraindicated. Stent migration remains a concern, but should be avoided with longer and or additional anchoring stents. And I hope that evidence is now accumulating that this technique is no longer just aspirational. And I just want to thank the team who have helped us, uh, my consultant colleagues, fellows, imaging people, sell on the TOE and our nurses and surgeons. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Rosendahl, for such an excellent talk. Um, amazing job. Um, is opening new opportunities. Um, we were thinking on moving on to the next session uh, to be able to give every speaker the time and then save the questions for the end. Um, so we'll get back to you with uh, 